Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. I would like to thank Governor Kraniak for his kind, more than kind, fantastic hospitality and express our special gratitude to his staff for the excellent organization of today's meeting of the Governing Council. We will now report on the outcome of today's meeting. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. Owing to high energy prices and increases in indirect taxes in some euro area countries, Inflation rates are expected to remain above 2% throughout 2012, but then to fall below that level again in the course of next year and to remain in line with price stability over the policy relevant horizon. Consistent with this picture, the underlying pace of monetary expansion remains subdued. Inflation expectations for the euro area continue to be firmly anchored in line with our aim of maintaining inflation rates below but close to 2% over the medium term. Economic growth in the euro area is expected to remain weak with ongoing tensions in some euro area financial markets and high uncertainty still weighing on confidence and sentiment. Our decisions as regards outright monetary transactions, OMTs, have helped to alleviate such tensions over the past few weeks, thereby reducing concerns about the materialization of, destructu of destructive scenarios. It is now essential that governments continue to implement the necessary steps to reduce both fiscal and structural imbalances and proceed with financial sector restructuring measures. The Governing Council remains firmly committed to preserving the singleness of monetary policy and to ensuring the proper transmission of the policy stance to the real economy throughout the euro area. OMTs will enable us to provide under appropriate conditions, a fully effective backstop to avoid destructive scenarios with potentially severe challenges for price stability in the euro area. Let me repeat again what I've said in past months. We act strictly within our mandate to maintain price stability over the medium term. We act independently in determining monetary policy and the euro is irreversible. We are ready to undertake OMTs once all the prerequisites are in place. As we said last month, the Governing Council will consider entering into OMTs to the extent that they are warranted from a monetary policy perspective as long as program conditionality is fully respected. We would exit from OMTs once their objectives have been achieved or when there is a failure to comply with the program. OMTs would not take place while a given program is under review and would resume after the review period once program compliance has been assured. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with economic analysis. Euro area real GDP contracted by 0.2% quarter on quarter in the second quarter of 2012 following flat growth in the previous quarter. Economic indicators, in particular survey results, confirm the continuation of weak economic activity in the third quarter of 2012, in an environment characterized by high uncertainty. We expect the euro area economy to remain weak in the near term and to recover only very gradually thereafter. The growth momentum is supported by our standard and non-standard monetary policy measures, but is expected to remain dampened by the necessary process of balance sheet adjustment in the financial and non-financial sectors, the existence of high unemployment, and an uneven global recovery. The risks surrounding the economic outlook for the euro area continue to be on the downside. 
They relate in particular to ongoing tensions in several euro area financial markets and the potential spillover to the euro area real economy. These risks should be contained by effective action by all policymakers in the euro area. Euro area annual HICP inflation was 2.7% in September 2012. According to Eurostat's flash estimate, compared with 2.6% in the previous month. This is higher than expected and mainly reflects past increases in indirect taxes and euro-denominated energy prices. On the basis of current futures prices for oil, inflation rates could remain at elevated levels before declining to below 2% again in the course of next year. Over the policy relevant horizon, in an environment of modest growth in the euro area and well anchored long term inflation expectations, underlying price pressures should remain moderate. Current levels of inflation should thus remain transitory and not give rise to second round effects. We will continue to monitor closely further developments in costs, wages, and prices. Risks to the outlook for price developments continue to be broadly balanced over the medium term. Upside risks pertain to further increases in indirect taxes owing to the need for fiscal consolidation. The main downside risks relate to the impact of weaker than expected growth in the euro area in the event of a renewed intensification of financial market tensions and its effects on the domestic components of inflation. If not contained by effective action by all policymakers in the euro area, such intensification has the potential to affect the balance of risks on the downside. Turning to the monetary analysis, Recent data confirm the subdued underlying pace of monetary expansion. In August, the annual growth rate of M3 decreased to 2.9% from 3.6% in July. While this decline was mainly due to a base effect, monthly inflows were also relatively contained. Conversely, strong monthly inflows into overnight deposits contributed to a further increase in the annual rate of growth of M1 to 5.1% in August, compared with 4.5% in July. This increase reflects a continuing high preference for liquidity in an environment of low interest rates and high uncertainty. The annual growth rate of loans to the private sector declined in August to minus 0.2% from 0.1% in July, reflecting a decrease in the annual rate of growth of loans to non-financial corporations to minus 0.5% from minus 0.2% in July. By contrast, the annual growth of loans to households remained unchanged at 1.0% in August. To a large extent, subdued loan dynamics reflect the weak outlook for GDP, heightened risk aversion, and the ongoing adjustment in the balance sheets of households and enterprises, all of which weigh on credit demand. At the same time, in a number of euro area countries, the segmentation of financial markets and capital constraints for banks restrict credit supply. The soundness of banks' balance sheets will be a key factor in facilitating both an appropriate provision of credit to the economy and the normalization of all funding channels, thereby contributing to an adequate transmission of monetary policy to the financing conditions of the non-financial sector in different countries of the euro area. It is thus essential that the resilience of banks continues to be strengthened where needed. To sum up, the economic analysis indicates that price developments should remain in line with price stability over the medium term. A cross-check 
with the signals from the monetary analysis confirms this picture. Other economic policy areas need to make substantial contributions to ensure a further stabilization of financial markets and an improvement in the outlook for growth. As regards fiscal policies, euro area countries are progressing with consolidation. It is crucial that efforts are maintained to restore sound fiscal positions in line with the commitments under the Stability and Growth Pact and the 2012 European Semester Recommendations. A rapid implementation of the Fiscal Compact will also play a major role in strengthening confidence in the soundness of public finances. At the same time, structural reforms are as essential as fiscal consolidation efforts and measures to improve the functioning of the financial sector. In the countries most strongly affected by the crisis, noticeable progress is being made in the correction of unit labor costs and current account developments. Decisive product and labor market reforms will further improve the competitiveness of these countries and their capacity to adjust. Finally, it is essential to push ahead with the European institution building. The ECB welcomes the Commission proposal of September 12, 2012 for a single supervisory mechanism, SSM, involving the ECB to be established through a Council regulation on the basis of Article 127.6 of the Treaty. The Governing Council considers an SSM to be one of the fundamental pillars of a financial union and one of the main building blocks towards a genuine economic and monetary union. We will formally issue a legal opinion in which we will, in particular, take into account the following principles. A clear and robust separation between supervisory decision-making and monetary policy appropriate accountability channels, a decentralization of tasks within the euro system, an effective supervisory framework ensuring coherent oversight of the euro area banking system and full compatibility with the single market framework, including the role and prerogatives of the European Banking Authority. As the Commission proposal sets out an ambitious, an ambitious transition schedule towards the ESSM, the ECB has started preparatory work so as to be able to implement the provisions of the Council regulation as soon as it enters into force. We are now at your disposal for questions. Hello? Oh, okay. Just a quick reminder. Two questions per media, no more, and present yourself before asking your question. Thank you. Let's go to the second row. Yes, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. it's okay. Stefan Weicker with Bloomberg. Um, two short questions, Mr. Draghi. The first one, you mentioned uh, downside risks to the economy again. Have there been any discussions today about a possible rate cut in the months to come? And the second one on Spain, um, do you find the Spain bond deals appropriate at the moment or are they still hampering your monetary policy transmission? Thank you. Uh, well, on, on the first question, the answer was no. And on the second question, I will not comment. Uh, that, thank you. Uh, but let me say one thing I forgot. If there, uh, Marco will answer questions about Slovenia today. So you, you will just... Um, I have to ask him about Slovenia. Thank you. Okay, your neighbor, please. Mansarenko, M and I. Mr. Draghi, was the decision to leave rates unchanged unanimous? Is the first question, and the second is, what do you think about publishing the minutes much sooner than 30 years after the respective meetings? Thank I'm sorry. You. What is the second question? <laughs> what do you think about publishing the minutes, minutes much er, much sooner or earlier than 30 years after the respective yeah. meeting? Thank yeah. you. <laughs> 
No, no, on, on, the first, on the first question, I would say that there was no discussion. So in a sense, it was a unanimous decision about interest rates. Uh, but on, on the second question, you see, it's uh, uh, clearly there have been s statements by several governing council members and by myself showing an open mind about this point. But it's a, it's a complex uh, process. Uh, and we are actually thinking about this, how, how to proceed. Um, there are pros and there are cons. But what you have to keep in mind is that the ECB is already a very transparent institution. Just think about this press conference every month. That by itself. But also there are hearings in Parliament, interviews, speeches. So um, I think there may be some uh, benefit in, as far as communication is concerned from having greater transparency. At the same time, we have to value and assess uh, what it means in our specific context, the European context, which is different from the United States, it's different from the UK. You're welcome. Okay, let's go to your neighbor. Tom Fairless from Dow Jones. Uh, Mr. Draghi, last month when you announced the OMT, you said that matters were now effectively in the hands of governments. How concerned are you at the way that governments have responded since then? I mean, the, the, some finance ministers have suggested that the ESM might not be covering legacy bank debts, for instance, and Spain still has, hasn't applied for a bailout. Um, my second question is on Greece. Um, how, would you, how would the ECB feel about rescheduling uh, the repayments on the Greek bonds, and would that qual qual uh, qualify as monetary financing? Thank you. Uh, on the second question, the answer is yes it would qualify as monetary financing. Uh, we've said several times that any voluntary restructuring of our holdings would be uh, equivalent, to, would be monetary financing. On the first question, uh, I could say that today we are ready with our OMT. We, are, we have a fully effective backstop mechanism in place once the, all the prerequisites are in place as well. Um, and that addresses your question. Uh, governments have made uh, substantial progress on a variety of fronts, and we can discuss it later, on a variety of fronts, both uh, what, I, call, uh, what I, call, I would call vulnerable countries and countries that are in, under a full program of the IMF. All, you could see actually this progress all across the board as far as fiscal consolidation is concerned, as far as structural reforms are concerned, and also as far as repairing some of the, uh, some of the flaws of the banking sector. So uh, at this point, it's uh, really up to the government to, to decide what they want to do. The mechanism is in place. Um, now, uh, the, your question about the ESM, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, we, we'll have to assess exactly what it means. And I don't want to prejudge the technical discussion that will take place, but we have to remind that this is not, it's not a matter for the ECB. It's a matter for the governments concerned. It's governments, it's taxpayers' money. So uh, they will have to discuss and take a stance on exactly what is meant by legacy assets. Thank you. Okay, the same row on the right hand block. Yes, right. Uh, Brian Blackstone with the Wall Street Journal. Right. On the, uh, back to the OMT, you mentioned that uh, there's steps that need to happen before the ECB would activate it, that the, that's in the government's hands. Does that weaken the effectiveness of the OMT because you make yourselves part of the political process in Europe, which can be time-consuming and complicated. And my second question is on uh, the continued rise in youth unemployment in Europe, the austere, anti-austerity protests. How concerned are you about unemployment, youth unemployment, and is austerity making the problem worse? Thank you. Um, the first question is about, uh, about conditionality. conditionality. We view conditionality as a, an essential part of the activation of the OMT. And I've made this point since the very beginning. Conditionality will actually have several roles. First of all, it will reduce the moral hazard by governments. Uh, the second thing, the second role it will have is that uh, 
really, in a sense, protects the independence of the ECB. Uh, without conditionality, you would certainly have what people call fiscal dominance. With conditionality, the independence of the ECB is protected. But there's a third angle to this. You can look at conditionality as um, a way to uh, create a credit enhancement on the bonds of the country that is actually the object of conditionality. And you can see why. So it's an, in, it's an incentive to pursue the right economic policies which has benefits for all parties concerned. Now, you are saying that uh, the, 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 just, just also look at the, well, certainly there is going to be some, some rightly so, some political process. And, but look at this from another angle. Imagine that uh, you have, uh, you know that one of the conditions is the signing of an MOU with a Eurogroup. And once you have that, you have unanimity. And you have the whole of Europe that's supporting politically this program. By itself, this is an extremely forceful ingredient in the program. Uh, the second question was about youth unemployment. It's, um, uh, we, we, we completely share the concerns of, uh, of this situation. And several times, as a matter of fact, both in independent speeches, several members of the governing council have raised the issue of youth unemployment, of high unemployment, and especially focused on the youth, uh, on the young uh, part of the population. It's, a, it's an incredible waste of resources, and uh, it uh, will have to be addressed, and it can be addressed by proper refo properly reforming the labor market so as to decrease the dual nature the labor markets have taken uh, on the last, I would say, seven, ten years in some European countries. So you have to address the dual nature of the labor market and you have to keep, uh, the challenge of course is to address the dual nature of the labor market while keeping it flexible overall. Your neighbor, please. Yeah. Uh, Michael Steen from the Financial Times. Um, Mr. Drenghi, is the, um, would a, a rate cut even be conceivable at the moment, uh, given that the transmission mechanism is broken? Um, I mean, would it, is there any way, of, would there be any point in conducting such a thing until OMT has been used or, or there's been a sustainable and uh, significant drop in the bond yields of uh, the countries that have got distressed bond markets? Or is that an overemphasis of, of, of the way you see this broken transmission mechanism? Um, and second question, um, we're in uh, Slovenia um, at the uh, spot where uh, pr uh, George W. Bush had his first ever summit with uh, Vladimir Putin, after which Bush said uh, he looked into Putin's eyes and could see his soul and knew this was a man he could do business with. I was wondering if there was any such uh, moment today between you and Mr. Weidmann. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to know from you who's Putin, who's G. W. Bush. <laughs> I leave that to you to decide. <laughs> okay. Now, on the, on the first question is, uh, in a sense, it's a, it's, a, it's a purely hypothetical question in a sense, but it, it, it can be addressed saying, non-standard monetary policy measures are being designed and implemented when the standard ones are not fully effective. Otherwise, we would simply stay with the standard policy measures. So this, in a sense, answers your question. And uh, the second but, question but does is... does that mean you can have both at the same time, sorry? I'm sorry? Can you have both at the same time? You mean both are ineffective? Yeah. <laughs> can, no. you, can, you <laughs> carry on, can you carry on using standard measures at the same time as having to deploy non-standard ones? Well, we have to see uh, if we can repair the monetary policy transmission channels. We, always, we don't speculate on future changes in interest rate, really. I think uh, uh, that, um, the, well, the Governing Council has assessed that uh, the, uh, the price level and the rate of change of prices is in line with uh, medium-term price stability according to our definition. So that is the assessment we made about the interest rate. And as I said, uh, we, there was no discussion. But answering your second question, I am 
um, I can say that the discussion was, uh, uh, I don't want to comment on individual positions, of course, but the discussion was very constructive all across the board. Okay, let's go to the row behind. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Maria Novak. I'm from Reuters. Mr. Draghi, uh, you keep encouraging banks to um, uh, repair their balance sheets. Uh, and I'm wondering, do you think that they should be able to use um, ECM funds for that as for their existing problems as well? And my second question, question um, regards Spain. Uh, do you think that a precautionary credit line uh, for Spain should be sufficient to solve uh, Spanish financial problems? Thank you. On, on the first question, I think when I said there has been significant progress, uh, I, included, I included the repairing of the banking system and the statement that EBA president made yesterday or th that uh, basically where he gave the numbers of the recapitalization that has taken place so far are reassuring from this viewpoint, are reassuring. So the, the, re the capital cap or the capitalization gap that uh, was pretty wide until two years ago has been uh, significantly reduced by the, Europe by, the European, by the Euro area banks, by the European banks. On, uh, on Spain, and uh, that's one example where significant progress has taken place. Uh, significant challenges remain ahead as well. But the progress on the front of fiscal consolidation, on the front of structural reforms with the announcement of a very large reform program, on the front of uh, the banking uh, sector with the conclusion of the stress test, is, is really remarkable if you think uh, how many measures have been announced, legislated, and implemented in such a short time. Your neighbor now, please. Eva Kunin from Reuters. Um, Mr. Draghi, just to follow up on that question, um, does that mean, uh, would it be enough for Spain to continue on its reform progress? for the ECB to start buying bonds, or would Spain actually commit to much harsher reforms in order for you to, to intervene? And um, my second question would be uh, about a year ago, um, you said in, in a similar press conference that you would make periodic checks on whether you're in sync with the tradition of the Bundesbank or whether you're deviating from it. And yeah. I was wondering what your assessment is today, whether you're in sync or how close are you? Yeah, on, on the second point, I can, I can uh, answer right away that uh, if the tradition of the Bundesbank is to, uh, was to assure price stability, uh, the ECB is full in sync with that tradition. On uh, the first question, uh, well, you see, there is a tendency to identify conditionality with harsh conditions, as you said. Conditions don't need to be necessarily punitive. Actually, many of the conditions have to do with structural reforms, which have both social costs, but also great social benefits. And if they are well designed, the second are going to be greater than the first. So it's um, third, it, is, it, uh, is it enough? That's up to the Spanish government to decide. And it's up to the other Euro area governments to decide whether the uh, programs uh, whether we, you know the conditions, you know that uh, it's necessary to uh, make a request to an EFSF, ESM program. Uh, we would s actively seek the IMF involvement in the process. Uh, but having said that, we have in place now a mechanism which is a fully effective backstop if these requests come and the assessment of the governing council about the monetary policy transmission channels grants action. Thank you. Thank you. The row behind on your left hand side. Oh no, the same row, sorry. And I've turned the row behind. Um, I'm David Tweed from Bloomberg Television. Um, I was wondering whether you could explain your thinking with regard to Portugal, because Portugal does look as if it's met the prerequisites for the OMT um, to work. So why hasn't the European Central Bank bought Portuguese debt on the secondary market? Um, and then one 
because we're in Slovenia, um, the Slovenian government is going ahead with the institution to um, take over the non-performing loans from the banks in return for providing them with government bonds. Will those government bonds be eligible um, if the banks present them for, as collateral? I will answer, I'll answer to the first question, you will answer to the second. But uh, the, um, on, on Portugal, that's a case where, uh, where uh, that's an, an example of uh, the significant progress that I've hinted at before. Um, very, very significant progress has taken place. Uh, the, uh, also, the overall uh, situation, politically speaking, is a strong situation. Um, it, there are serious, obviously, we, we, com we, we share completely the concerns that uh, uh, have been expressed about the difficult social situation as well. But the reform agenda is firmly in place. The OMT would not apply to countries that are under a full adjustment program until, and that's, the, that's what I think I did say last time, until uh, full market access, complete market access will be obtained. And this is because the OMT is not a replacement for lack of primary market access. By the way, on this front, uh, we, we, have, we had, uh, uh, among several, several positive news we had in the last few days, uh, we had one in Portugal, namely yesterday, uh, for the first time, a five-year bond was issued. So it's... it's, that, the, that's, it's, it's that's the, not full market access no, under your No, that's definition. not the complete market access, but it's the beginning of, of, the, it's the beginning of a complete market access. So it's, it's something that's actually another reassuring bit of news. Yeah, on Slovenia, uh, you're right, uh, the parliament adopted uh, the law on uh, the agency that would uh, try to uh, carve out uh, bad assets from the banks, but uh, the precise uh, modality of uh, the uh, eligibility of these bonds has not been decided yet, so I am not able to uh, tell you whether this would be acceptable or not. I can only tell you that pool of collateral which is available to Slovenian banks is uh, at the moment sufficient and it is not an urgent matter. I understand that it will be elaborated in the further steps uh, on this law. Thank you. The row behind, please. Yes. Stefan Rukam with uh, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Um, have you seen any signs that the pure announcement of the OMT framework um, has affected the uh, easing of credit conditions in the weak countries? And uh, second question is, um, um, have, you, have you discussed what could be a good measure to decide uh, what is the acceptable level of fragmentation, financial fragmentation, and what is an unacceptable level? Yeah, on, on, on the, the, the first question, the answer is yes. We had, um, we had well, you all saw what, what happened. Me. Because, I forgot that, because the last, the, the figures of today, the August figures show that, especially in, in Spain, it's, it's getting worse. Well, uh, Actually, uh, the, you also what happened, there was a substantial significant improvement all across financial markets, then there was a correction, and, um, and, uh, and basically now, we, if we take a snapshot now with respect to, say, the beginning of August, we see that um, the various uh, interest rate spreads are still at a level way below what it was uh, in July. Um, we see that uh, in, uh, there is another, there are two, uh, one, one comforting news was what I said before about Portugal having issued the first five-year bond. The second, the second good news actually concerns Spain, that Spain has uh, completed almost 90% of their funding program for the sovereign. Yeah, can but, I, but, but just, you are not aiming on, on the... Can I finish? Oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, uh, taking a snapshot of what the credit conditions are, that was your question. 
There have been sizable issuance uh, by corporations and by banks since then. Um, and frankly, something that's dear uh, to, to our eyes, and we we'll always look at that, target two balances or imbalances have somehow stabilized. Yes. And uh, so that's, that's a good, uh, so all in all, the, the effect has been, has been positive. There have been sizable inflows of bank deposits in Italy. The um, Spain recourse to central bank financing has gone down in the last month. So, not bad. Um, the second question. Um, do you have any measure to tell the difference between an acceptable level of fragmentation and an un oh, unacceptable. Yeah. Now, uh, let me finish. Not, not bad, but I think that we, have to, we have to express also a note of caution here. Um, first of all, volatility is still relatively high. And second, uh, governments will have to persevere in their reform action on all fronts fiscal consolidation, structural reforms, the banking sector, and more generally, the financial market sector. Um, what is an acceptable or level of fragmentation? I, well, it's hard to say. But certainly, when you see, uh, when you see uh, the same, uh, when you see two subsidiaries of the same company uh, loc located in two different countries and paying completely different interest rates for their borrowing, when you see the, exactly the same individual borrower, uh, say a young couple that has to buy a flat and paying a completely different interest rate in mortgages, then you start asking yourself, maybe there is a problem here. Then you look around and you see that credit flows are normal in one part of the euro area and are non-existing in another part, they are actually falling precipitously in other parts and have been falling for a long time. When you see that you have widespread credit rationing in some parts of the euro area, when you see that there is a correlation between the movements in the exchange rates and the interest rates, that is a very strange correlation, namely that uh, the uh, exchange rate appreciates when interest rates go down uh, and vice versa. When you see that the BIDA spreads reveal profound lack of liquidity in certain markets, when you see the levels of volatility are abnormally high, and when you see that you have the inversion of the yield curves all of a sudden, and then disappearing right after an announcement, then you say you have a reasonable and possibly unacceptable level of fragmentation in the euro area. But uh, the issue is really uh, is the, the, the level of fragmentation becomes unacceptable when the singleness of the monetary policy in the euro area is being put into question. Because that is the time when we cannot achieve our primary objective, namely maintaining price stability in the long, in the medium term across the euro area. Thank you. The lady just next to you, and after the lady behind, and then we will go to the other block. Vysna Zadravec, Television of Slovenia. Uh, I would like to return to the question of uh, bad banks. Um, ECB had uh, some concerns regarding the establishment of this agency or a bank, and I would like to ask you, Mr. Draghi, if these remarks still stand, or... Um, do you support this, uh, uh, let's say, resolution for Slovenia? And uh, the second questions, uh, the question is, what are your recommendations for Slovenia regarding fiscal consolidation? Um, uh, do you think that Slovenia needs a bailout? <laughs> I think Marco will, uh, will respond best to both questions. But by and large, let me say that we agree with the assessment of the IMF. That's in uh, the overall assessment the IMF has, has issued. But Marco? Yeah, just to say a few sentences. Um, ECB, of course, made an assessment of the law that was uh, adopted. And we understood it in a sense that, of course, uh, the uh, view was that uh, uh, the agency 
the government and the uh, central bank should cooperate closely in deciding how to uh, make the bank uh, sector more resilient. And the second question uh, uh, regarding the bailout, I think it's much too early to say anything about it. Uh, all macroeconomic indicators at the moment point out that uh, if the country adopts decisive stabilization measures in the fiscal consolidation, in uh, labor markets, in pension reforms, and of course in the banking sector, the country would not need to apply for the program. But uh, it is a political decision at the end. As the uh, President also said, uh, in many countries it is primarily a political decision. The central bank cannot operate in an uh, environment which is inherently unstable from the macroeconomic point of view. Thank you. The lady behind, please. Albina Kenda with the Slovenian Business Daily uh, Finance. Uh, being the member of the Slovenian uh, press, my question my question is rather similar. The decision on the OMT program has contributed um, uh, enormously to calming of the situation in the markets. Um, however, the yields on the Slovenian government bonds remain rather high and uh, surpassing the Spanish, uh, the yields of the Spanish uh, government bonds. What do you believe are the factors that could calm down this situation, which is very worrisome for the Slovenian citizens? Uh, sorry no, uh, that I have to take it's uh, over. No, no, no. Yeah, the spreads uh, have, uh, that you have noticed in the markets, uh, in our opinion, do not reflect the fundamentals. You should uh, take into consideration that uh, the capital markets for Slovenian paper is very shallow, the uh, transactions are rare and one cannot judge from a single or double, twi true or three transactions about the uh, underlying fundamentals. We believe that with the adoption of the measures that I mentioned before, stabilization measures, spreads will go down. And I understand, no, I, I don't only understand, you can uh, verify yourself, spreads have gone down. With the adoption of further measures, I believe that spreads will go down as uh, they did in other uh, Eurozone countries. Okay, let's go to the first row on the right and block here. Let's. Well, on, uh, on, on, the first, on the first point, uh, we will certainly monitor the strategic response of the issuers to our program. Uh, the OMT is not meant to induce strategic response in favor of issue in short terms by the, by the issuers. So this will be monitored. By the way, I, I think, uh, but that's my sort of purely personal uh, perception is that um, many, all these countries, the, the countries that may need an OMT, have now reached after many years of, uh, I would say, difficult, very difficult process, a reasonable maturities, reasonable durations in their stock of public debt. I think it's very unlikely they will change these durations in favor of a short-term issuance, first because they have market access. They, it's not that they don't have market access. These countries do have market access. So there is no reason really to change uh, the duration and uh, having to do, you know, it's not only pros, 
if you change the duration, you also have some serious cons. So all in all, I think it's unlikely. In any event, the uh, ECB will closely monitor this uh, possible strategic response by issuers. The second point is really, I think it's just the other way around. Um, I think I did say something about this last time we had this press conference. Uh, we started thinking when, when the OMT was designed, we uh, had the uh, perception and the evidence that there were tail risks in the euro area, namely that there was a, a bad equilibrium for certain countries in certain markets. It means that uh, expectations were self-feeding uh, and would create, in the end, disruptive scenarios. Uh, so that's, what, uh, that's the case for the policymaker, which in this case is the ECB, to step in with the program. At the same time, we shouldn't forget how these countries got into a bad equilibrium to begin with, namely uh, bad policies or, in some cases, no policies at all for a long period of time while the rest of the world was changing completely. So the first conclusion was that uh, any monetary policy would have no effect if the other policies wouldn't change. That's why conditionality is so important. It's actually, as I said at the beginning, is what makes the monetary policy effective. And it's what protects the independence of the ECB. So it's not really, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't buy the example, the example you made. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's really an integral part of this. The second question, well, this was the second question, really. Thank you. Yes, your, your neighbor, next question, yes, first row. Uh, it's Claudio, it is Claudio Perez from El País. Uh, Mr. Draghi, are you comfortable with the current situation with uh, Spain doubting about uh, rescue and even Germany? Or did you expect a more, uh, a more rapid reaction from the political side? And secondly, if I may, do you think that Spain has a possibility to resolve its crisis without uh, uh, European aid? I, unfortunately, I cannot comment on either of the questions because it's very much the decision whether to start this uh, process is entirely in the hands of governments. Uh, as, as I said on and on and on, uh, I think with the OMT, uh, the ECB has done uh, what uh, really was uh, possible and uh, the OMT would certainly create an environment which is conducive to reforms because it could remove the, what we call the redenomination risk. So it could remove tail risks, but then in the end, the initiative is in the hands of governments. And, um, and, uh, and I could not comment on the second item either. Thank you. Your neighbor, and after the two last questions, yeah. Alessandro Merlio of Sole 24 Ore from Italy. You've spoken several times about tail risks and uh, now redenomination risks. Uh, yields have come down since your announcement in July and then your further announcement. Uh, how much of these risks have been removed and do you think it's just a temporary effect to a return in case the OMT is not applied? And as you've made uh, the OMT dependent on, that's the second question, on a request, and the government seem to be extremely reluctant to make this request. Uh, and the monetary policy transmission mechanism is still broken. Uh, have you thought about any other solution that you could apply in that case? Well, for the second question, for the time being, no. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> we, we have the sense that we, we've, um, it was a, a very important uh, decision which uh, has many dimensions. We had to cope with all these, and it's now in place. We are ready, and we have a fully effective backstop mechanism in place. Um, now it's really, it's really in the hands of governments, and uh, as I said many, many times, the ECB cannot replace the action of governments. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, um, is, is your question about the level of interest rates, whether they reflect uh, redenomination risks and so on. As I said last time, we are considering a variety, 
a variety of indicators here, one of which is the interest rates, but then we also consider, as I said before, the beta spreads, the liquidity, the, the shape of the yield curves, the volatility. Um, so there is a variety of uh, indicators which will certainly inform our monetary policy assessment. Okay, the question, the first row, and after the last question will be there. Marika De Feo, Corriere della Sera. Uh, for the ESM, uh, uh, about the recapitalization uh, of banks uh, through the ESM, uh, do you see any uh, possible way out? Uh, and if you see uh, uh, being discussed, uh, if yes, uh, which one, please? Uh, and then uh, the second question, the markets are already discussing how uh, the target uh, at which you could intervene in the markets once that Spain uh, or another country could ask for aid. Uh, do you have a special uh, target or range of target? Now to the second question, the answer is uh, no. We, as I said again before, just before, uh, we are looking at a variety of indicators and uh, we will look at all of them because we have to have a monetary policy assessment. Uh, what is the degree of disruption, uh, to go back to the question I had before, what is the degree of disruption of our monetary policy transmission channels? That is certainly a question we have, we have to answer. The, on the first question, the, the ESM, as I said before, it's really very much in the hands of governments. Um, they took uh, the initiative a few months ago, maybe a year ago, a year and a half ago, to create the ESM. Um, now that it's about to enter into force, uh, there are certain limitations that are being brought forward to the table. There is going to be a political discussion, and uh, I, frankly, it would not be right for the ECB to prejudge the outcome of this discussion, expressing views on it. The last question on the seventh row, please. Hello, Mr. Draghi, Florian Neuhan from ZDF German Television. Um, I'd like to ask you on the supervision of banks. Um, I would Sorry, like the supervision of banks. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, to ask you how do you want to ensure that uh, both tasks of the ECB will be separated? Because at least in Germany, there are still important voices who have many concerns about this uh, potential conflict of interests. And also Mr. Weidmann recently in an interview raised these concerns. So what would be your, your response to that? I think, I think there are very, very important concerns that uh, we are addressing with a proper internal organization. The proposal doesn't leave much option to this, so we have to organize, if, if, the, if in the end will be the ECB, the institution, we certainly have, and this is, was, I think, one of the principles that I stated at the very beginning of this, uh, of this, uh, this discussion, the, we have to make sure that we have an organization which de facto assures separation between the monetary policy and supervision. And this can be done delegating, fully delegating uh, to the supervisory board the tasks. So the, fortunately the commission proposals, proposal foresees the possibility for the governing council to delegate super, all the supervisory tasks to the supervisory board. So the means the say the management, the organi internal organization means are there. And uh, I, I, I think I, I can, I mean, I believe it can be achieved. 